ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನಾಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ಪಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹಾಯಿ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 Okay, well, let's see if we can share successfully here. Here we go, October 6th. Publisher's Desk. <clears throat> Concentration and Willpower. It's a new one. It's from October's Hinduism Today. So it's just been out there a few days. Exploring how our meditative life strengthens the outer and our external life sharpens the tools to go within. We all know individuals who don't connect their inner life to their outer life. Outside of meditation, When they are at work or school, they don't apply the same level of willpower and concentration. Some even belittle ordinary life, taking a whatever attitude. It doesn't matter as much. The inner life, that's what's important. The outer life, that's something to be endured. And first question to you, what's wrong with such an attitude? What's wrong is that it's the same us. There aren't two of us. There isn't one us that meditates and another us that works or goes to school. It's the same us, the same mind, the same soul. We don't become a different person. When we turn within to meditate and then come out to meet our responsibilities, our dharma, we are the same person inside or out. Concentration is focusing the mind on a single object or line of thought, not allowing it to wander. If we seriously focus on our inner goals when we meditate, and then come out and don't strive to control our thoughts at work or school, it's counterproductive. It's like exercising intensely for one week and then not exercising for three weeks. Is the one week going to benefit us? Not so much. If we go within and meditate and successfully, successfully concentrate our thoughts for an hour and then come out of meditation and go to work or school for eight hours and let our mind wander where it will, is that one hour of meditation going to do us any good? Some, of course, <clears throat> but just like in the exercise example, not as much as it could. Spiritual progress, we need a continuity of effort between our inner life and outer life, between what we do in meditation and what we do when we are actively, positively engaged in the world. Conversely, if we pay attention to what we are doing at work or school throughout the day, if we concentrate and don't allow our mind to just wander because it can, because we know how to do what we are doing, then we will enhance our progress in our outer activities and that adds power to our meditations. Take driving, for example. We know how to drive. We could think about anything as we do. We are washing dishes. We could do a blindfolded while pondering all kinds of things. But if we don't allow ourselves to do that, if instead we concentrate on what we are doing, that helps our inner efforts. That enhances our restraint of the mind, which tends to meander. It's a continuity of effort. When we don't draw a line between our inner and the outer, the control gained in our meditative moments stabilizes our emotions and mental prowess, and the willpower gained by harnessing the mind during the day adds to our focus during meditation.
having concentrated on what we are doing in the external world, when we sit down to meditate, what happens? What do you think? Having concentrated on what we are doing in the external world, when we sit down to meditate, the improvement is cumulative. We have controlled our mind during meditation and we have controlled our mind during work or study. Each day our concentration will improve, similar to exercising. We exercise every day. What happens to the muscle? It has to get stronger. There's no choice. That's the way the body works. If we control our thoughts when we meditate, and when we work or at school every day, our ability to concentrate has to improve. It works the same way. And next question to you, how would you define willpower? Let's look next at willpower. Willpower is the channeling of all energies toward one point for a given length of time. It's a great definition. Willpower is the channeling of all energies toward one point for a given length of time. An example of lacking willpower is a student who wants to get up early to study to do well on a test, but then sleeps in anyway. The desire is there but the willpower isn't strong enough. Willpower is an interesting phenomenon. Why do you think willpower is an interesting phenomenon? What's unusual about it? Generally, the more you use something, the less you have. If you spend money, your bank account decreases. You go into the kitchen, you take some food, you cook it, you eat it, and the amount of food in the kitchen goes down. Willpower isn't like that. The more you use it, the more you have to use. It's like having a $3,000 bank account and spending 2,000 only to find the balance increase to 5,000. Why is that? Willpower is like a muscle. The more we use it, the more we have to use. Another interesting aspect of willpower is interest. Gurudeva said that awareness, energy, and willpower are one and the same thing. What does it mean to you to say awareness, energy, and willpower are one and the same thing? That could be a challenge to figure out if you haven't thought about it before. How can those three be the same thing? We are doing something we don't enjoy. It never seems to end. It may only take five minutes, but it seems like an hour. When we are doing something we love to do, an hour seems like five minutes. That's awareness, energy, and willpower being the same thing. The more we are interested in something, the more energy we draw out to do it and it seems effortless. The less we are interested in something, the harder it is to do. If we can find a way to be engaged in whatever we are doing, it's a lot more fun, and we are a lot more focused. If we are bored, then it seems to take forever and forever, 
and distractions are abundant. The energy comes when we draw on it. The energy increases when we are interested. How do we strengthen our willpower? First of all, it's easier to cultivate it in external things. That's one of the advantages of not dividing life into external and internal and thinking about the internal in a very precise way and the external in a very undisciplined way. To sit in meditation for an hour and concentrate or control our thoughts is difficult because it's abstract. To do a physical task well is a lot easier. To study a subject and do it well on a test is also a lot easier because it's not abstract, it's concrete. This makes it easier to strengthen our willpower and improve our ability to concentrate when involved in outer tasks. That's why external tasks are important and not to be neglected by the meditator. We're developing our concentration and willpower, which will be available when we sit down to quiet the mind. Guru Deva gives us a simple key for strengthening willpower he taught this is the answer to the question. Finish every job you start. Sounds easy, right? But we don't necessarily do that. We all have things in life we start and then give up. Why? A major reason is starting things impulsively, not thinking them through before we begin. Perhaps our friends are doing it, our neighbors are doing it, so we'll do it too. That's not necessarily a good enough motivation to finish a task, because when they give it up, maybe you will as well. Clearly, we don't want to be impulsive when we start something, because then it's likely we will not follow it to completion, and that will create a negative habit pattern in the mind. To avoid that, it's good to get adequate thought, give adequate thought to a project before you embark on it, to maximize your chances of finishing it. Each time, you constant, each time you complete a task or a project, you strengthen the pattern. You set the stage for completing the next one and the next. Such positive habits are worth developing. Second statement from Gurudev on strengthening willpower adds this idea, do it well, but he doesn't stop there. Do it even better than you initially planned then you are using a little extra willpower, more than you normally use to get by, and that strengthens your willpower. In summary, get rid of any conceptual division you have between the external and the internal. Keep in mind that a great deal of your spiritual progress is made in the external world. It's where we learn to concentrate and use our willpower. Those abilities are needed to control our thoughts when we sit down to meditate and succeed in going deeply within. Ideally, we don't stop meditating when we open our eyes, nor do we stop worshiping when the puja ends. Most advanced practice is controlling awareness throughout the day, not just when we are sitting quietly. We want such continuity. Gurudeva took it even into the night, saying, Restraint of our mental movements eventually extends even into our dreams, so we do not go where we don't belong. <laughs> like that, where we don't belong. Even on the astral plane, that's an advanced state we can work toward. In the meantime, take each moment to practice, use each moment to develop the willpower needed to achieve your spiritual goals. So that's our new pub desk. Going out in Hinduism today. <clears throat> and second topic, character building, 64 character qualities from a character building workbook. And we got through the C's, but we're up to D. Decisiveness is the 18th character quality. How would you define decisiveness? That's quite a noise in the background. Like a big city. 
It's just a big piece of machinery. The workbook gives this definition. Decisiveness means acting with certainty and firmness. I practice it by carefully considering a matter, praying for Ganesha's guidance, making a decision, and following through with determination. The opposite is indecisiveness. And we get Gurudeva's quote. Changeableness means indecision, not being decisive, changing one's mind after making a deliberate positive decision. Changing one's mind can be a positive thing, but making a firm, well-considered decision and not following it through would gain one the reputation of not being dependable, even of being weak-minded. To be indecisive and changeable is not how we should be on the path to enlightenment nor to be successful in any other pursuit. Um, perseverance and fear must be overcome, and much effort is required to accomplish this. Reflection. Take a moment to identify a few ways in which you could improve in decisiveness. And our third topic, answering your question, send to satsang at hindu.org. Again, this is just one question I'm answering today. Is it necessary to do annual tivasam at the temple or home for those loved ones who have passed? If so, how long do we need to perform the ritual? EPT gives this definition of Tivasam. Tamil word, the Tamil word Tivasam refers to a day that is dedicated to performing rituals or ceremonies in remembrance of deceased ancestors. It is commonly associated with Hindu customs, where family members conduct rituals on the anniversary of a loved one's death, usually the death anniversary. This observance is also called Shraddha. That's the word Gurudeva uses or Tivasam, and involves offerings, involves offerings like food and prayers, which are believed to bring peace to the departed soul. So that is clear what we're talking about. So this is one I've shared before, but it's really good in this context. For ancestors, there is an interesting statement by Yoga Swami in words of our master. All the good done by charity and almsgiving in the name of the dead will reach them. And they will also help you. They will come and help you in dreams. Oh, very interesting. And long quote from Gurdjieff. Ancestor worship is a form of communicating with departed ancestors, seeking to be guided by their advice because they have a broader vision, a superconscious vision. They are not bothered by the mundane affairs of eating and sleeping and family intrigues. They know how to bring the collective family along to its next phase of development. They will eventually, of course, seek to reincarnate in the same family to work out their parabdha karma, one reason for the Hindu Shraddha ceremony is to help the departed soul be reborn in the same family. Similarly, we would want our monks to come back to the same monastery and keep coming back until they fulfilled their highest aspirations. The Hindu wants to be born back into the same family, even in the same house, and families want to bring relatives back as well, so the karmas can be worked out consistently lifetime after lifetime. This is one reason that on the nakshatra of the death, certain rites are performed to court the departed person back. 
In many Hindu traditions, after the death of a loved one, Shraddha ceremonies are performed on the death anniversary for 12 years. Therefore, each family that shares an ancestral worship or ancestral communication is, in a sense, a tribal group with a sectarian portion of the religion, within a sectarian portion of the religion. Who better would know the solutions within a family than someone who has lived in it? The ancestors, ancestor has already reincarnated, the whole family would intuitively know it. That's important. The greater the maturity of the soul, the longer you can stay in the inner planes. Some world of darkness people come back immediately. They die on one end of the hospital and are born in the other end. The average person would usually reincarnate somewhere within the 12 year cycle. If the family realizes the person is coming back and prays for that to happen, he or she would have to come back within 12 years. Once they realize the person is back, they would stop doing the ceremony and be off doing other things. So this is a related question. Would it be appropriate for Saiva householders to observe Pitrupaksha? Would we consider that ancestors come from the Pitra Loka to reside in our homes for this period of time? Oh, answer. Guru David did not do any writings on Pitrupaksha. I would say that if your family has a traditional way of observing Pitrupaksha, then continue it. If you don't have a traditional way, then just focus on the individual Shraddha ceremony on the anniversary of the death. So we get asked, asked about Pitrupaksha every few years, but Gurudeva did not write on it at all. So if it was super important, I think he would have written on it. But he did write on the Shraddha, the annual ceremony. Oh, thank you very much. Let's see. Down here. There we go. Oh Oh Oh